we're going to go ahead and start looking at Hebrews. We'll start in chapter 5 tonight. Are there any questions about Hebrews from either the last couple studies or from what you've read on your own? Okay. Um, can I have somebody read the first uh, five verses? Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is sub subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he, had off he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was de designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Thank you, Rick and Todd. So let's uh, we'll we'll kind of go verse by verse here, starting back in verse 1. One thing that's important to realize, remember, we are the outsiders in Hebrews. We're the outsiders. The people who it's written to, they're very Jewish. They've got a strong tradition. They've got a strong culture in that. We don't have that. So there's a lot of questions that they're, that they're going to have uh, that we don't even necessarily think twice about. And one of those big questions that uh, a Jew would have is, how in the world does Jesus is Jesus qualified to be a priest when he's not even a Levite? This is a big Jewish question. And once again, we don't really even think twice about that. So in Genesis, I'm mean, sorry, Hebrews chapter 5, he's going to start addressing it. But he really doesn't give us the answer until Hebrews chapter 7. So let's look at the first at the first part here. In the Old Testament, um, the 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 ancient world wasn't foreign. It is foreign to us. So a, a good example of that would be um, Israel had what was called a three-part temple. They had the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. That was not a a new concept. There were there were we have record of numerous temples, not just from the Jews, but from the ancient world with that same three-part system and the temple. It was the holy of holies. That wasn't something the Jews invented. It wasn't something God invented for the Jews. Um, the, the biggest difference between the Jews' temple and the pagan temple was that in the center of the Holy of Holies, there was not an idol for the Jews. In the center of the Holy of Holies for the pagans, there was an idol. That's, one of the, that's really the biggest difference there. Uh, the, the, the law, the, the biblical law was not the first law in the ancient world. It wasn't, you know, wh what made it different, though, was uh, more the quality of what was in the law. How you treated people was related to how you worshipped God. Um, and in the same way, priests. Priests were not invented by the Jews. Um, you know, dietary restrictions like in the book of Le Leviticus, those were known in the ancient world. Uh, priests, that, that preceded Jews. So when you, when you come to a thing like 
priest. Y- 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 you, you have a whole different historical thing that we're just completely missing because we're so far removed. And I think the, the, the correct place to start whenever you're talking about a priest is, well, what is a priest? It's a, it's a very good question to ask if you're going to talk that Jesus is our priest, so what is a priest? Um, see, we, even now we have even more baggage to bring with it because we're not just bringing the ancient world, we're bringing like Catholic priests and, and all that and, all, and our history of that. And it's kind of tainting a lot of what we see. So verse 1, for every high priest chosen from, am- from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacri- sacrifices for sins. So here he's talking about specifically about uh, priests in the Jewish order. Um, so uh, uh, priests are appointed by men. They're appointed for men. But priests are also called by God to do things of God. So you've got like this, I- uh, priests are basically these in-between guys. And uh, th- the basic role of priests, when you go as far back as you can in history, the basic role of a priest was they assisted people in making their sacrifices to the gods. That was the basic idea. Um, sometimes it would be more of overseers, like while you were doing it at a temple, they would just kind of keep an eye on if you needed any help or that kind of stuff. Well, uh, the, the power of priests varied greatly throughout history. Sometimes they were very lowly, and sometimes they had equal voice with the king. Uh, there's a, a period of Egyptian history, for instance, where the pharaoh and uh, the priest, I think it was the priest of Amun-Ra, uh, were equals. Uh, they, they both kind of, you know, and that's because the pharaoh was a representation of the god, and the priest was the priest to the god, so they ha- had kind of co-equal roles. Uh, but then you get later on in history, and this, that goes up and down. I mean, I'm sure everybody here remembers a story uh, from the Middle Ages where the pope and the king had a little bit of a standoff <laughs> as to who was going to, you know, who was going to win out, who was going to have to uh, have penance and all that. Uh, spoiler alert, it was the king. <laughs> and uh, so there was that whole power struggle there. And throughout, uh, throughout history, we have these, these different struggles that happen between people taking advantage of the priestly, priestly role and people that are doing well. In fact, I was reading in Acts today, and Paul's, t- uh, Paul's before the high priest, and he makes this comment, and, and he gets slapped. And Paul says, you know, this was not lawful for you to do this. And uh, so there's a good, good example of the, the high priest having... Uh, overstepped his his biblical bounds. So I, I think if we really want to get a basic idea of what a priest is, it's basically uh, a priest uh, is a mediator between God and people. Um, there's typical things about priests throughout history that, that are usually right for all the different cultures. Um, they're usually dedicated to the God or the gods, um, kind of, you know, in, in, their, in their tasks. They oftentimes wear special clothes, um, priestly garments, um, they are a representative of both people and God. So you could call a priest a mediator or a representative. They are representative of people in the way that they present people before God. They present themselves before God because they're a person. But they're a representative of God be- by the way that they, they teach the people, they lead in the sacrifices. So they're just in between people. Now, Israel was a little bit different because um, in earliest Israelite culture, they didn't have the tribe of the Levites. You were just, it was more like um, you could be a priest just because you wanted to be a priest. Well, then when Moses came along with the law, uh, that kind of got ex on that. When, when, the, when the people were brought out of Egypt, th- they didn't have, uh, they had priests, but they didn't have a priestly line. So when Moses brought the people out, he established the tribe of Levi as the priests. Well, technically it was the sons of Aaron, and then it became the tribe of Levi, but that's kind of not really relevant. Um, and so uh, how that works is Israel had his different sons, and each of the different sons became a tribe, and that one of those sons, which was Levi, became the Levites. Uh, so, but how, uh, what it looked like in the ancient world is they would have different families that would be priestly families that lived in that area. So you could say, like, the Waltmeyer priests from the Roswell area. You see what I mean? They had different things like that. Uh, the Canaanites especially did that. Um, the Canaanites were kind of a looser group anyways. So when you're talking about a high priest, um, the idea there is just a priest over priests, a head priest. It's, it's, um, I- the roles were slightly different. Uh, the high priest typically had more honor. Uh, they were allowed once per year to go into the Holy of Holies, and the Jewish, uh, I- I the Jewish high priest uh, was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies for the Day of Atonement, uh, which we looked at that a couple, uh, I want to say a couple of probably a couple months ago. And uh, so, th- so they, they had that, and they oversaw, you know, the all the other priests. 
But that's a basic idea here. So it's saying that Jesus is, fun- is he's going to be functioning as the high priest. So let's move on from there. Um, verse two says he can deal gently with ignorant and wayward, with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Now, see, this is kind of ironic because that's not always what happens, right? He can deal gently, but that's not <laughs> that's not always what happens. So what the author of, of Hebrews here is talking about, he's more talking about the ideal of what should happen. He he can deal gently with ignorant and wayward. That's you know what he ideally what should happen. <laughs> But he doesn't always do that. Uh, and why does he not always do that? Because he himself is beset with weakness. So typically, there's going to be three different uh, realities of what actually happens. That, uh, that, that's, the, that's the ideal of what priests should do. But typically, these are the one, of the, one of the three areas where priests are going to go. And pastors the same and, you know, spiritual leaders. Uh, and I, I want, as I'm saying these, I want you to think of which one you think you have the hardest time with. Okay, just put yourself, pretend like you're a priest, okay? Um, the first one is an indifference to sin. Sin's just not that big of a deal. Um, you know, and, and this is actually really popular in our culture nowadays. Uh, it's ju- it, it, right and wrong is kind of just subjective, so it's just not that big of a deal. Um, the second view is it, it's where you get sentimental. So you care so much about the person that you feel bad for them, so you have empathy, so you kind of downplay the role of sin, because you want to love the person past the sin, and so you just kind of make it where sin's not a big thing. And the third, the third reality of how people typically go astray is getting exasperated towards the sinner for messing up. Um, now, once again, this isn't the ideal of what a priest should do, <laughs> but this is the reality of, of what, what happens with priests. So we get to verse 3, and it says this, Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice because of his weakness, uh, for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. So the mediator is himself a sinner. He's no better than them. This is going to cause a problem. And this is actually one of the points that the author of Hebrews is, is bringing up. The priests, by their very nature, were unable to do the job that they were actually appointed to do, be the mediators. So this should have clued them into the fact that the priest wasn't the final, The fi- there was something else better coming, which was Jesus. But the but like with a lot of the law, the Jews missed that. So then we get down to verse um, four, and it says, "And no one takes his honor, the honor of being the the priest, for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So appointed by men, but called by God. So basically, think of uh, Old Testament pastors. Okay, I was uh, elected by you guys, voted in, whatever." Uh, but I was called by God. It's the same, the exact same idea. Uh, so then you get to the the problem that really is being brought up in this passage. And he's once again, we're going to look. At th- he's going to kind of drag out the answer a bit in chapter five and seven and a little bit in I think it's eight. How did Jesus become a priest if he wasn't a Levite? And this is a very good question. It's just a very Jewish question. So also Christ did not exalt himself. So he's not, he's going to transition now between priests generally. To now he's going to kind of whoop now about Jesus as the priest. Uh, not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son today, I have begotten you. So you'll remember that this verse was, was quoted way back earlier in Hebrews. He's bringing it up again, and he's doing that to kind of tie in a few ideas. We'll look at that in just a minute. Um, so we get a, a, a partial answer here. The partial answer to how Jesus could have become the priest. Because he didn't choose it for himself. The Father called him. The Father appointed him. So that's the first way. Now, obviously, that doesn't really answer the full question because the law did still require him to be a Levite. So the, the, the problem hasn't been resolved. It's just been introduced. Um, and so now we get, uh, let's hop over to what I mean about the tying the two ideas in. So um, the reason why Jesus can be the priest, uh, okay, so he's been called by the Father. And then he, he meets that with two different statements. You are my son, you are a priest. You are, you are. And he's tying these two ideas in this way, that God became the mediator, that's how he can be the mediator, and he could do this as the begotten. So that brings the earlier theme of Jesus being the, being the son, brings that into, into so now he's, this is his way of saying, remember all that stuff that we said in chapters one through four? Yeah, we're bringing that in and tying it in now. And then he quotes the next verse, which says, you are a priest forever. And it kind of just, boop, ties them together. So now we can look at verse 6 and kind of see how it ties in. As he, al- as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
Which brings the obvious question, what does that mean? <laughs> Who's Melchizedek and what's the order of Melchizedek and what? So that's not going to be, a, a, that's, he's not going to answer that question until chapter 7. In fact, he's going to interrupt himself here in just a couple verses. In verse 11, he's going to say, I wanted to explain this to you, but I can't anymore because you guys aren't listening. So hold, put a pin in that. We'll wrap up there, but let's stay on point in verse 6. And the idea of verse 6, as he, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, is that he's an ongoing priest. You are a priest forever. He's an ongoing priest. Um, it's not like uh, the earthly priests where they were just a temporary role, uh, you know, they lived for a couple years or whatever. This is, a, this is an ongoing thing. as a priest forever. Um, and it's, it's important to know here that he's drawing a line here that this is not according to the Levites or the law, but according to the order of Melchizedek, um, which he's going to obviously, like I said, expand later. Now, if you notice, he says the exact same thing like two times here in the dead center of it and at the very end, verses 6 and verse 10. I'm going to read 6 and I'll read 10. As he says also in another place, you are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. Then you hop to verse 10 and he says this, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is his way of, uh, what do you say, parenthesizing, uh, drawing attention to something, uh, really emphasizing a main point that he's getting at. And uh, uh, before I before I before I say that, because I've got a little chart here that's going to show what I'm what I'm trying to say here about that. But um, the question now becomes: Well, when did Jesus become a priest? Has he been in this order of Melchizedek from the ancient of days, or has he been there recently? Or when did when did that happen? And he's going to answer that question, but he's not going to answer it here. So we're going to move that to, to a later date. I'm just going to bring it up to your mind and, and let you kind of think about it over the next couple of weeks. Um, so now if you look at this chart on, on, the, on, the, on the side there, you kind of see the breakdown here. It's a little bit hard to see because I wanted it all on one slide, but uh, try to work with me here. Uh, those are all the different verses, and I've broken them up into uh, their categories because this is what it seems like. When you're reading through these verses, verses 1 through 4 sounds like they're going to be argued against. Like they're going to be contrasted. This is the way of the earthly priests, but that's not the way of Jesus. But that's not what he does. Um, he actually does the exact opposite. He compares Jesus with the earthly priests, which honestly it, it feels like not what you're expecting. So it's a little bit jarring sometimes to, a mod to modern audiences. Um, and uh, another thing that I, that stuck out to me when I was reading it is he doesn't focus on the reality of how the priests are. He focuses on the reality of how the priests should be. So now we get over here to the, to the comparison here. Uh, verse 1 starts out with introducing the idea of priests as mediators. Verse 9 closes out with Jesus as the mediator. And we're going to look at them back to back, so don't feel like you have to go back and try and figure this out on your own. Verse 2 is talking about how priests are weak, and verse 8 is talking about how Jesus is weak. And verse 3 it talks about how priests are called out, called, uh, called out to God. And verse uh, 7, it talks about how Jesus was called out to God. And verse 4, priest, um, I'm missing out here. I'm missing something here. Hold on. I missed a line somewhere. Oh, okay. In verses 3 and 7, and 3, it talks about how priests called out, like cried out to God. That's what I'm trying to say here. In verse 7, it's how Jesus cried out to God. In verses 4, a priest called by God. Verse 5, Jesus was called by God. And then right here in the center, uh, the idea of the order of Melchizedek, it, it parenthesizes it, starts it and, and ends it in verse 6 and 10. So, uh, now that we've kind of seen that, let's kind of get a little bit more, um, less clinical, I guess you could say. Um, so the reason why you could do this is because it was after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, we're good. Let's move ahead to verse 7, or I guess 4 and 7. I'm going to go back so you can see how they've kinda the verses tie in. Uh, so you'll remember that 4 and 7 are related here. Although that's not right. I think I mean 4 and 5. Yeah, I mean 4 and 5. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. And then verse 5, So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son today, I have begotten you. Now we can go on to verse 3 and 7. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. He's talking about the earthly priests here. 
So now the contrast says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Just as the earthly priest had to offer up sacrifices, um, so also Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him uh, from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. So it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to compare, but there's going to be some differences, and I'll, and I'll highlight them at the end. Um, throughout Jesus' life, he, he offered up prayers and supplications, but this verse is primarily talking about at the Garden of Gethsemane. In the days of his flesh, so yes, while he was alive, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Now we're getting more focused into a certain area of his life, which was the Garden of Gethsemane. To him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Now this brings up a very interesting question. It says that God heard him. But if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, God didn't have the cup pass from him. He was praying and he said, God, if it's possible, have the cup pass from me. But God didn't do that. So how can Hebrews possibly say that he heard him if the, if the prayer wasn't answered? And this is what I would say about that. And where is it? God heard him, but did not take the cup from him. God heard his prayer. He uh, he raised him from the from the dead, but he did not he did not take the cup from him, um, and I think that this is an important point to make because if we can say that God heard Jesus' prayer without answering the prayer, I think that that should mean something for us too when we're also praying. That just because God heard your prayer or didn't hear it doesn't mean you're getting what you're asking for. You know what I mean? Like this, it's not necessarily going to go your way or how you want it to go, or whatever, but that doesn't mean that God didn't, didn't hear, your cr- hear your prayer. But I think it's also important to note that this, that this verse probably has something to do with um, when Jesus was on the cross, and he was crying out with a loud voice, and then he let, he let, his, he let his breath go. And, uh, you know, I think that it also ties into that as well. So a little bit of a contrast here between uh, earthly priests and Jesus. Earthly priests make offerings for their sake and the people. Jesus had prayers for himself and us. So that's, that's about the same. Jesus made prayers and appeals for his sake and ours. The earthly priest did it on account of their sin, whereas Jesus did it on account of his suffering. And remember, Jesus' suffering wasn't just the suffering on the cross. Him coming as a, as a human and everything that followed that whole ordeal was Jesus' suffering. So... Um, so there's a little bit of a contrast and a little bit of a comparison there. Now we get to verse, uh, I guess, 2 and 8. And it says this in 2. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, talking about earthly priests again, since he himself is beset with weakness. Earthly priests are, are weak. They're, 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 they're human. So they, can, they, they have the ability to understand other people, even if they take advantage of it, even if they maybe don't always feel up to it, whatever. They at least have the ability to. And so then in verse 8, although he was a son, talking about Jesus, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So in the same way that earthly priests are weak, Jesus became weak. And the, the, the thing that's interesting about this is that what verse 8 is saying is that Jesus had the right, but he didn't coast on his status. Jesus had the right, he just didn't coast on it. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He stuck with it, obeying through the suffering. It's easy to suffer. It's really easy. Anybody can suffer. It's hard to obey God through the suffering, and that's something that set Jesus apart, that he already had the status, but he set it aside and then went to suffer and then obeyed God through the suffering to have it completed. Um, So another way of saying that would be that Jesus was not too lofty to put up with us, which is is a very important thing because if, if Jesus was too lofty, Hebrews probably wouldn't have been written in the first place. Uh, We would be looking at a completely different uh, gospel. Um, So he can deal gently with us who are weak because of his weakness, although it was self-imposed weakness, obviously. And that takes us down to verse 9 and 1, which says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So here we see a lot of things that that, that Jesus uh, does. uh, He's appointed by God. He acts on behalf of men. He offer, offers gifts and sacrifices. Yep, everything there is all connecting. Because, he, because God, Jesus obeyed through his suffering, he proved his character 
And you could say, another way of saying, and we looked at this before, the whole idea of, in verse 9 here, where it says, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Um, the idea of being made perfect, we looked at that a couple months ago, and the idea was basically this, he earned what was his right. Uh, being made perfect in the, go- in the book of Hebrews carries more of the idea of, not that he was imperfect before, but that he lacked the experience and he hadn't done the task. Uh, he To be made perfect is to, to finish, to have something come to its intended conclusion, to arrive at a new stage of experience having done the thing. Um, so you could say, uh, maybe a modern example would help. Let's say I don't have any kids. I'm a perfect dad even though I've had no children. Well, that's easy to do. I mean, I, you can be the world's best dad when you never have kids. But when you actually have kids, it's, it's a little bit different. You know, the rubber meets the road. And so it's a lot easier to say, hey, I'm a perfect dad, even though I have no children, than it would be to say, hey, I made mistakes as a dad, but I was there and I did it. Right? It is a, it, it, God doesn't expect us as parents to be perfect parents. He expects us to carry it through. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's, that's the goal there. Uh, so in the same way, it's not that it's not that um, it's just that Jesus didn't have that experience. So okay, something that is important from vo- verse nine, uh, verse nine, that kind of pops out because if you start in verse nine, it starts off with uh, what's it called? A d- kind of like a dependent clause, but not really. It's kind of like a, a lesser idea, um, a, a, a side note, um, and being made perfect. That's like the side note. That's not the main idea of verse 9. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. That's the main idea of verse 9. And uh, when he says this, the, the thing that's really important to focus out on here is because he says, he became the source of salvation for those who obey. So he didn't become the source of salvation for all, but for those who obey. Now this is important because there's a lot of different doctrinal things that, that this is addressing. First off, Calvinists. Calvinists uh, believe that Jesus only died for those who would be saved. Okay, that's not true. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Okay. But then there's another idea that says that it's called uh, universalism, which basically says everybody will be saved in the end anyways because God's just so merciful and compassionate that he's not going to be able to eternally punish people, so he's going to somehow before the end intervene and just everybody's going to be saved whether they want to be saved or not <laughs> you will spend eternity with me <laughs> and uh, uh, and so this is uh, this verse is kind of contradicting that so let's move on let's look at some of the differences that exist between uh, Jesus and the earthly priest because remember this whole section here verses 1 through 4 and then 5 through 9 have basically been a comparison between Jesus and the earthly priest and not really drawing too many uh, strong differences but there were some differences that I think really stuck out um, the first off is it says that Jesus was the source of eternal salvation, whereas priests are not the source of eternal salvation. They are ongoing mediators. And the fact that they have to be ongoing mediators is a testament that they aren't the finished product. That's not the, the, the end game. They are shadows that don't really fulfill the need. And really everything in the Old Testament is that. Um, the Old Testament law, it doesn't tell us what society should look like. It doesn't tell us what the golden standards of morality are. The Old Testament law never told us, uh, you know, hey, owning slaves is probably wrong. Never said that. It allowed for slaves. It allowed for those things. And the reason why is because the law wasn't meant to be perfect. It was a shadow that was just meant to show our need for salva- for saviors. It was, uh, Galatians calls it our let me think of the word. Our, it's like our, our, our stand-in. Oh, I can't remember the word. That's going to bug me. It, it doesn't matter. Um, it, I believe it's Galatians. Maybe it's Romans, but I believe it's Galatians. He, he talks about the way that, that the law is our temporary guide. Guide, that's what it is. Our temporary guide until the Savior would come. It wasn't meant to be the end product. It wasn't perfect. The law was not the golden standard. It is actually throughout the entire New Testament they criticized the law again and again because it wasn't perfect. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was just a temporary thing to say, "Hey, y'all need Jesus." That was it. Mission accomplished. It pointed the way to, towards Jesus, and that's what happened. Um, so the law didn't do it. The, the priest, w- I mean, not the priest. The temple was a shadow. We weren't meant to go to a holy place. We were meant to be a holy people. Uh, what was the other thing? The priests. The priest was a shadow. We weren't meant to look to men for our salvation. 
So, I mean, you can go down everything in, in the law, and it's, it, you just see it over and over again. Um, and so when he talks about eternal salvation, the source of our eternal salvation, the idea there, he's not talking about once saved, always saved in this life. He's not talking about an ongoing search of salvation. He's talking about, when he says eternal, the source of eternal salvation, he's talking about the way that this is a finished task. Jesus had done, has done the thing. It's the source of our eternal salvation. That's the source that we go to. And it, it, sometimes it's a little bit, doesn't, sometimes when we read the Bible, things don't really make sense because in English, did you know English has a lot shorter sentences than Greek does? <laughs> so you, you read in, 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 in English, and it just kind of gets to sometimes where it kind of bogs you down because you're thinking, wait, what's even the main subject of the sentence? It's going on for forever. You know, whereas in Greek, you don't really get that because words are, uh, the, the meaning of the word is carried in the ending of the word. So you can kind of just see the flow a lot better. And it, it translations don't get that. And so sometimes when you're going through parts like this, it just you get lost in the bog. Um, another thing that are di- that's different about Jesus versus the priest is, is here's a good example. Let's use angels as as the example, okay? Angels are messengers with God's word. Well, that's just like what a priest is, a messenger with God's word. But it's not the actual word itself. It's someone who is sent with the word. And that could be the that could be a good distinction between Jesus as the priest and the earthly priest. The earthly priests are not the word itself, but Jesus is the word itself. So the priests were just carrying on the message. Um, another d- point of difference uh, is that Jesus wasn't a sinner, but he did encounter temptation. Um, another point of, uh, of, of, not disagreement, but separation between the earthly priest and Jesus was that uh, Jesus didn't have to offer for his sins, but he did cry out for his weakness. Um, another big big thing, which I think, to me, this is probably the most important one that you see through verses 1 through 10, um, and maybe that's just because of my background, was because Jesus wasn't ever chosen by men. It said there in the, in the priest about how priests were chosen by men. Jesus was never chosen by men. He was appointed by God according to the order of Melchizedek. And then that's a, I think, to me, that's one of the, one of the highlights of these 10 verses. Because you have, Jesus was rejected by people, and they weren't looking for him when he came. I mean, they were just, what? You know, and then he came, he was appointed as a priest to people who still wanted the Old Testament law. They didn't want the new, they wanted the old. They wanted to just stick with it. And uh, that's exactly the idea of Hebrews. It, well, we just kind of want to go back to how things used to be. You know, and so that's the whole idea there. So then you get to the last two verses, verses 10 and 6, and I'll read them in the opposite order, so 6 and 10. As he, sa- as he says also in another place, you are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek, and again, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That, that pretty much uh, finishes the whole idea here. Jesus is the high priest declared by God, but here is where the writer is going to completely cut off his discussion. If you read on in verse 11, he says something like this, and I have a lot to say, but it's difficult to say it. And he says that his reason is because they became, become, uh, different translations say different things. Some of them say um, you become lazy. Some of them it says uh, something along the lines of uh, hard of hearing, I want to say. is, is And so I, I've, I've come up with a, different, a couple different things here that might help you get the idea of what he's saying. Um, it seems to me, I could be misreading this, but it seems to me like what he's talking about is a little bit of spiritual arrogance. Like we already know, so we don't need you coming in here and, and telling us. Um, I could be off base on that one. Uh, hardness of heart, which is what he talked about in verse four, three and four, uh, where um, where people are just they're not they're not softening their heart. They've got their mind made up, and they don't want to be confused with the facts. Um, another it would be bitterness, maybe, um, especially since later on in Hebrews he talks about how watched out that there's not a spring of bitterness that comes up in you, uh, which is obviously a challenge for all of us. I think. Um, I mean, is for me. <laughs> Maybe you guys have it all together, but I, I, I don't. Um, then another thing, maybe backing off would be a good way of saying that uh, because they are wanting to go back to the Judaism. Um, a loss of zeal or loss of excitement for the things of God, you could say like that. Uh, laziness and things of God. All those things, I think, are, are, are accurate. 
Uh, so if you just go through and read it yourself, I think you'll get the, the, main, the main flow of it there. And so if we were to summarize these ten verses, I think we could do it extremely easy with this very simple sentence. Jesus was appointed as priest by God. I think that summarizes all ten of those verses uh, very well. Um, so, okay, yeah. Uh, but keep in mind, the issue really hasn't been resolved yet. So keep that in mind. And if you want to go through and read uh, the rest of Hebrews a couple times, I would encourage you. Uh, because it gets it gets a little bit heavy, and uh, you know it kind of gives the answer to that. So, okay.